In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So it's a joy here to be in Toronto on Sunday. And uh, I will have at around noon the Mass in St. Catharines, and then tonight the Mass in Syracuse, New York. And uh, do pray for our um, second year of the seminary, which is now in progress. And uh, for all the seminarians that come, pray for all of them. We simply want to do what our founder did, Archbishop Lefebvre, which is simply resist the Pope for his modernism publicly, resist him to his face for destroying the church. And St. Robert Bellarmine says when you have a Pope destroying the church, he doesn't cease to be Pope. There's no one above him to remove him. And even if he's a heretic, says, says John of St. Thomas, he does not cease to be Pope. He holds the authority, but he's a bad Pope. And it's up to Christ, who is the only authority above the Pope, to remove him. It's up to Christ to remove him, and up to us to resist him. And that's why the most loyal sons of the Pope today are those resisting him to his face like Archbishop Lefebvre did. Holy Father, we respect you. We respect your authority. We pray for your conversion. But we have to disobey you. And we have to remind you you're standing opposed to all your predecessors who condemn you. And you oppose your own, uh, the one who gave you your keys of authority, Christ himself. You do not teach his doctrine. And because you don't teach his doctrine, you will face him face to face. And you will answer to him. Frightful the judgments of Paul VI. Frightful the judgments of these modernist popes. Frightful who have, who have worse than the synod that just happened this week of allowing uh, praise to perverts as adding something to the Catholic community, Catholic parish, in their own words, but uh, allowing communion to be given to, non, to non-Catholics, that's in the new Code of Canon Law from 1983. Pope John Paul II is responsible for that. And then uh, allowing communion to be given to those living in mortal sin. These are called sacrilegious communions. And being the new Mass, you just hope they're not valid, so they won't be more sacrilegious. But that is the, the moral, the immorality taught by the Catholic Church flows logically from the, the doctrinal heresies and compromises of Vatican II. And so, what do we do with these bad popes? We just re- simply resist them. And what do we do when you have leaders of traditional communities, leaders of traditional orders, our priestly fraternities, or such as the Society of St. Pius X, and St. Peter's, and Good Shepherd Institute, and Campos, all of them who have been sedu- seduced by dangerous, cunning words of, let's make a deal, let's get regularized, let's get normalized, and they lose the distinctions between Catholic Church and the conciliar church. They lose the, the reality that we are living in a major war. We are living in the times prophesied by the Virgin Mary, the times of apostasy, the times when the Pope will lose the faith and Rome will become the seat of the Antichrist. These are our times. So it's living in dreamland to pretend that the Pope is all good, and the Church is all good, and everything is one and united, and we just have to be happily recognized, and life goes on forever, happily ever after. But it's it's a total illusion. Total illusion. Listen to the words of Archbishop Lefebvre. When he was brought the objection, which you hear very often today, the objection that we have to get with inside the Church, to convert it from within. I hear this from priests. I hear this from many lay people. 
I hear it from people who don't even follow really what's going on. And it sounds good. In the normal times, of course, we want to be under the Pope, obedient to the Pope, and one with the Holy Roman Catholic Church of all time. But that's simply not the reality right now. The question was put to Archbishop Lefebvre in 1989, in July, in an interview with Fidelitar magazine. Archbishop Lefebvre was asked, Some people say, yes, but Archbishop Lefebvre should have accepted an agreement with Rome, because once the Society of St. Pius X had been recognized and the suspensions lifted, he would have been able to do to act in a more effective manner inside the church, or as now he has put himself outside. Don't you hear this today? Same thing. Let's get inside. What can we do outside the church? Listen to Archbishop Lefebvre. Listen to his answer, and it still applies now more than ever. Such things are easy to say. To stay inside the church, or to put oneself inside the church. What does that mean? Firstly, what church are we talking about? If you mean the conciliar church, then we who have struggled against the council for 20 years because we want the Catholic Church. We would have to re-enter this conciliar church in order supposedly to make it Catholic. That is a complete illusion says the Archbishop. That is a complete illusion. In other words, la-la land. It is not the subjects that make the superiors, but the superiors who form the subjects. Amongst the whole Roman Curia, amongst all the world's bishops who are progressives, I would have been completely swamped. I would have been able to do nothing. I could have protected neither the faithful nor the seminarians. Archbishop Lefebvre, this is such common sense, and yet this sense of the faith is being lost. Look at the Redemptorists, look at their Catholic magazine now. They're not allowed to travel all over the world and go other, into other dioceses of bishops since they made their agreement with Rome. The great Redemptorists who used to travel all over and give give the great redemptorist uh, missions of St. Alphonsus Liguri. And now they're locked up like their dogs in the dog houses. They're locked up in the dog house of their diocesan bishop, duct taped, and now they're already caving in to conciliar ideas. It happens all the time. And that's, what is at the root of this? What is at the root of this? Well, it takes us back to this Holy Gospel today. The king goes into the wedding and he looks to see who's there. And he sees one dressed in his blue jeans full of holes and his t-shirt full of holes, his hair all out of place. And he's at a wedding. And St. Gregory says this, this individual who is dressed unfitting for the wedding is a soul who is not dressed in the garment of charity. And he is cast out to the exterior darkness. So what is the garment of charity? It is not just a feeling, not just a humanitarian love for your neighbor, because that's not sufficient. It's not sufficient that we just have a philanthropy, a goodwill to our neighbor. We must have a supernatural love for our neighbor. And we must live in the supernatural charity of God. So to have the true charity means, according to the Catholic teaching of tradition, and not the new teaching of the conciliar church, but the traditional Catholic teaching means to love God and your neighbor, firstly, we must love God first. And that means we must share in His divine life. We must believe all He taught and share in His divine life by love. And this union of love 
This union of charity is called sanctifying grace. And sanctifying grace is, as St. Thomas Aquinas teaches, and many catechisms don't define it correctly, or they, they define it very in a shallow way. But sanctifying grace is the life of the Blessed Trinity in your soul. It means that you actually participate in the very life of God Himself. In other words, it's as if you have a blood transfusion of the precious blood, the infinite price of God's blood flowing through your veins. It completely transforms what you are. From a charcoal state of sin to a shining diamond. And the diamond, when held up in the sunlight, shares the light of the sun and reflects many colors. And that means all the actions, all your thoughts, all your affections, all your labors, all your work, whether you eat or drink, says St. Paul, do all to the glory of God. Do all out of love for God. So to live in love is to, is, means Christ's own words, which, where he says, whoever will love me and keep my commandments, we will come and make our abode in him. Who's we? Who is he talking about? The plural, we. He means the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost. The three in one, one in essence, three in distinction of persons, and the true living God gives us to share in His divine life. And uh, it's, it, if we understood what this meant, and what the reality really is, we would die out of love. St. Teresa of the Child Jesus, excuse me, St. Teresa of Avila was shown her own soul, in the state of grace. And she was so enthralled. She thought it was an angel. She, she couldn't explain the beauty of it. And our Lord told her, No, my daughter, that is your soul. Because I live there. And that is what God wants. That is, that's what it means to live in the love of God. And so, all that you do is transformed. And that's why it's so important what Our Lady of Fatima taught the children of Fatima. And that's the spirit we must have. The spirit of these children of Fatima, which is do everything for the love of God. And St. Teresa said, God doesn't look so much at how much you do or how big you do something, but at the love with which you do it. And... Sister Josepha Menendez, who descended into hell and saw them gnashing their teeth and heard their screams and their howls, she would descend into hell being dragged down by the devils. Our Lord would allow this for her in 1922 to 1923, five years after Fatima. Perhaps to reinforce that hell exists and to give us an insight of what they really suffer. And they suffer horribly. And the greatest torment, she says, among the damned, they curse their life. And many of them were people of all different jobs and different careers and different vocations. But the greatest suffering the souls tell have told her, have been forced to tell her, is they can't love anymore. They cannot love God. They want to love, love Him, but they can't. They just hate they can only hate. And even among themselves, they can only hate. And so, that is the absence of God. No love, no charity. And to live in mortal sin, to have broken seriously one of God's commandments, and live that way without confession, without active repentance, is to live in death. It's to walk like a, like a cadaver. And how many, how many, says St. John Chrysostom, how many at funerals weep and cry over their dead family member or friend? And they, 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 they weep and they cry, and some weep for days, some mourn for, for many weeks. And he says, why do you... 
weep over the dead so much when you have a living family member who's living in mortal sin. They're walking death. Their souls are in the coffin already. How come you don't weep for them? How come you don't cry and plead God's mercy for them? How come you don't speak to them with your heart of love to win them back, to win them to conversion, to repentance, to come back to the Sacred Heart who really died and loves each soul? How come we don't weep for those who are living among us physically, but are spiritually dead? And we live in this, the whole modern world is as unhinged from these realities. And most men, it's true to say, most men live in mortal sin today. Most people live in mortal sin. Drink sin like water. And the true love of our neighbor and the true comes from the true love of God. And we must first love God and live in His grace. And from that flows the love of our neighbor. And the love of our neighbor is firstly the good of their soul. And granted, we can't approach our neighbor with a sledgehammer. You've got to be Catholic or else. With some you do. With some they understand that language. And some need that. But most people, obviously, obviously, you have to approach in a very kind way, in a very gentle way, and, and explain and, and win their hearts, uh, as our Lord did, as our Lord himself showed us. With the woman at the well, he didn't, he didn't cast her off. He began a discussion, and he raised her. You can, in St. John chapter 4, you can see how our Lord elevates her mind. To, the, to see that he is the Messiah, the true Christ, the King, the true God. And she is so, because her heart was good. She lived sinful, but her heart was good. And there are many of these in the modern world. They're living in sin and may have even had many abortions. But they just were ignorant. They didn't really know what they were doing. And like this woman at the well, she had five husbands. And perhaps she had abortions. Perhaps. And she was one to repentance. And she was so converted by God's grace of the Sacred Heart. She converted the whole town. She became a missionary for the whole town. And they begged our Lord, stay with us a few days. And He did. And so, of course, she didn't have her cell phone. She didn't have the modern lies of the media telling her, filling her head with atheism and evolution, filling her head with materialism and godlessness, and that this world is all that matters. So that woman was a little more lucky than our, women's, our women today, and our people today, and our youngsters today, who are just filled day and night with complete trash from the media, the commercials, the shows, the useless movies, the, the, the hours and hours wasted on video games, children's youth wasted on video games. And uh, so the true love of God is to live in His grace, to love our Lord Jesus Christ with all our heart, our soul, our mind, and to live His commandment, which is to love our neighbor and the first love of neighbor is obviously for the love of their soul. And sometimes to get to their soul, you have to feed a hungry man. You have to give drink to a thirsty person. You have to help clothe the naked or help give a home to someone. But the main goal of this charity is to win them to the true faith. And that's where um, Mother Teresa of Calcutta God bless all her works of charity, but she was poisoned by Vatican II. And God will reward her charity. She, with her hands, picked up the poor of Calcutta, but she was poisoned with the liberal ideas of Vatican II. And she said, no, we shouldn't convert the Buddhists, we shouldn't convert the Hindus. 
Leave them as long as they're good Hindus and good Buddhists. And she was wrong. She was poisoned by the modernism of the Pope, which tells you even down to the littlest sister, when the leader of the church or the leader of a, of a congregation or the father of a family, when their head is poisoned and they teach false doctrine, that poison trickles down even to the lowliest nun, into the simplest people. And now, since Pope Paul VI and John XXIII introduced complete heresies into the church, how many Catholics today breathe and speak heresies? All religions are equal. Everyone is saved. All you have to do is be nice to your neighbor. Be welcoming. And uh, don't, co don't condemn your neighbor. Obviously, God condemns your neighbor. But we can't tell our neighbor who's living in mortal sin, oh, you're nice, we're nice, everybody's nice, everything is nice. It's not true. True charity is to say, look, you're living against God's law. Don't you realize that if you live this way, and I, if I lived this way, I would go to hell. Because our Lord said, if you love me, he didn't say, do what you want. If you love me, keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. And the Pope doesn't teach this. He has completely overthrown the commandments of our Lord. The first three, which concern God himself, and the last seven, which concern our neighbor. And what cruel, what can be more cruel than to teach that you can live breaking God's commandments and pretend that you're going to save your soul. And that's what he just did with this synod and these modernist bishops. These people living in mortal sin, divorced and remarried, and living in the state of perversion, or what they call in their, their uh, progressive speech, uh, alternative lifestyle, and they're teaching this to the youngsters now. They're teaching this to kindergartners. They're rotting the kids from a young age. What does our Lord say about this, those who cause scandal? Woe to those who scandalize the little ones. Better that a millstone be tied around their neck and thrown to the bottom of the sea than rather than scandalize one of these, my little ones. And we live in this age where Our Lady of La Salette said purity would not be known anymore. Even the little ones would be corrupted. And in 1846, people were wondering, how can, how can little children in their mother's arms and in their father's homes be corrupted? Now we see internet, TV, filthy advertising, corrupt public school education, evolutions shoved down their throat like a dogma, and all the atheism and godlessness, and our Lord Jesus Christ completely eliminated. They learn all about Hanukkah. They learn all about, all about Muslim culture. They learn all about the Jewish culture and their feasts and their Passovers. And if any child dares make the sign of the cross or defends the name of Christ, or if a teacher teaches anything truthful about the Catholic faith, they lose their job. So what a dark time. What an apostate age we live in. And so, let me quote to you the great Bishop Frippel of Angers in France. Angers is a big city, and not far from Angers is Avrier, where the monks of Avrier are, the Dominican monks. And these are his great words. He was a great bishop of the line of Cardinal P of Poitiers. He was a contemporary with him. These were the great anti-liberal bishops of the 1800s. What he says here applies more than ever now. Listen to this. The greatest misery for a century or for a country is to abandon or to diminish the truth. We can get over everything else. We can never get over the sacrifice of principles. If you water down the principles, you're gone. Now think about this in relation to the, now, the new SSPX. 
Characters may give in at given times. People may slip and fall and sin and, and, and fall miserably. And the public morality may receive some breach from vice or bad examples. But nothing is lost as long as the true doctrines remain standing in their integrity. With them, the true doctrines, everything is remade sooner or later. Men and institutions, because we are always able to come back to the good when we have not left the truth. To give up the principles outside which nothing can be built that is strong and lasting would take away even the very hope of salvation. So the greatest service, so he's saying here, to compromise, to give up on principles, everything is lost. And the Vatican II popes and churchmen have compromised on principles. And their man-made church is lost. And only those faithful to the true principles of the Catholic Church, of Catholic tradition, of the Catholic popes who stand condemning all of all Vatican II, all the encyclicals of the traditional popes condemning modern liberalism and modern separation of church and state and modern democracy and modern moral liberalism, once you, once you cave in on principles, you're gone. And that's why everybody's sleeping through the, the Vatican II of the SSPX, which happened in 2012. The general chapter statement, which overthrew the principle of Archbishop Lefebvre, that protected the faith. No agreement with Rome until Rome comes back to tradition. Now that's out the window. Now Bishop Fillet wants the agreement in the general chapter statement. The 40 priests who were present with Bishop uh, Fillet betrayed Archbishop Lefebvre. And they said, no, forget that principle. The principle of Archbishop Lefebvre, the principle of the 2006 general chapter, the principle of, of the three bishops, who at that time warned Bishop Fillet, don't do this. And Bishop Fillet himself contradicts himself, what he said ten years ago. And now they say, we approve it. We determine to make this agreement with Rome under the six conditions, which are lame, lousy, liberal, and sealed on top of that with a doctrinal declaration, which is completely modernist. And all this happened in 2012. There should have been a major uproar across the world. And what, what they did then was worse than what happened in the Synod in Rome this week. The Synod in Rome is very serious. But they are grave sins against the moral law. But like Bishop Frappel says in Cardinal P, it is far more serious to attack the Catholic doctrine. Because these attack God himself. And the people, we don't, we don't get this because we're all flesh and blood. We think the worst sins is neighbor is killing our neighbor. We think the worst sins is abortion. We think the worst sins are sins of the flesh. They all take souls to hell. That's for sure. And most souls are in hell because of sins of the flesh. But they're not the worst sins. Because the Mary Magdalene can still come back to our Lord. But if you attack the doctrine, you attack the faith, if I or you lose the faith, we're gone. There is no recovery except of a miracle of God. And so to attack the principles which happened in the Society of St. Pius X in 2012, how did they accept how did they compromise on principles? Well, read the doctrinal declaration. Accepting Vatican II in the so-called light of tradition, accepting the new mass as legitimate accepting the new code of canon law, which is loaded with heresies, accepting the new profession of faith, what Archbishop Lefebvre said was, was uh, compromising to Vatican II, and accepting religious liberty, which is a Masonic heresy attacking the kingship of Christ. These, 
These are major compromises. And that's what people have to wake up to. But many people today, well, it doesn't affect my pocket, doesn't affect my fun, doesn't, I don't see any dancing girls on the altar, so I'm not doing anything. But the greatest damage has been done, and that is the attack on the catechism. That's the problem. So this is what Bishop Freppel is saying, to give up the principles, you take away the very hope of salvation. So the, now listen to this. This is where you step in. So the greatest service a man can render to his fellow man or his country or now the Catholic Church. He's saying this back in the 1800s. He would have never dreamt of what we're living in. The greatest service a man can render to his kinsmen, to the church now, in the times when everything is failing and growing dim, is to assert the truth without fear, even though no one listens to him. Speak the truth. Assert the truth. Teach the truth. Live the truth. He continues, Because it is a furrow of light, it's a beam of light, which he opens through the intellects. And if his voice cannot manage to dominate the noises of the time, at least it will, be, it will be received as the messenger of salvation in the future. So this is what Archbishop Lefebvre did. The only bishop with Bishop de Castro Mayor, two of them, stood up amidst 2,500 bishops, the only two to, to fearlessly assert the truth. And now they're dead. And who is left? Where, is any, where are the bishops anymore? Bishop Williamson asserts the truth. Thank God. Thank God. But he's the only one now. The rest have all caved in. Even the, the three bishops consecrated by Bishop uh, Lefebvre, they have all, they're all going along because of their silence, at least, and at most fully agree with what Bishop Follet is doing. And this is why, who, who is standing? Who's left? A handful of priests, some monks, and quite a few faithful. It's always that way, more faithful than clergy. And this, dear friends, this is the greatest service we can render to our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the Catholics, to your children, your grandchildren, to your city, to the whole Catholic Church, is to just keep the faith, assert the truth, and live in the true charity of God by the state of grace. And this is, this is the miracle of our times, to live in the state of grace, to keep the state of grace. What is so easy? To live in mortal sin. And... So let's uh, ask the Blessed Mother, the Blessed Virgin Mary, to uh, make us her soldiers, to fight under her banner. We're in a time of war and not peace. And in a time of war, you have to fight. You have no choice. And in this war, the spiritual war, you ladies have to fight. You have your rosaries. You have your sacrifices. God gave you the gift of speech. Use it for the love of your neighbor. God gave you a smile, use it to win souls to God. It's by sweetness, says uh, Father Jean-Baptiste Muard. The sweetness of the Sacred Heart, the sweetness is the surest way to gain souls to God. And of course, St. Francis de Sales, his famous saying, uh, one drop of honey attracts more flies than a thousand gallons of vinegar. But you see, the liberals now and the modernists use that technique now of St. Francis de Sale. They use their smiles. They use their, their uh, affection and their, their uh, charmingness. But for what? To crucify our Lord. Like Judas, using a sign of greeting, a kiss on the cheek, which is a sign of between friends and those who trust each other, those who would never betray each other. He used something so noble in the most uh, ignoble way and that's what these modernists are doing they're using their smiles and the sweetness 
But it's not the sweetness of the Sacred Heart. Because the sweetness of the Sacred Heart leads souls to the truth, leads them to the cross, leads them to carry the cross. And this is the great deception of our times. St. John, the, in, the, in the Apocalypse, he describes one of the beasts of the Apocalypse. And he says it has lion's teeth and the locust, the body of a locust and hair of a, of a woman. Hair of a woman, but lion's teeth and claws of a bear. What's this creature? The hair of a woman is the effeminacy. The effeminacy. Nothing against the beauty and nobility of femininity and you ladies. But the effeminacy. And what effeminacy is in men, it's a disaster. And I don't just mean moral effeminacy. That's an obvious evil. But the effeminacy of the mind is the worst. When they have liberal ideas that all religions are the same. That all, all religions lead to the salvation that everyone is all totally equal, that modern democracy is the only government that really works, which is pure baloney. Modern democracy is condemned by the church, by common sense. And this effeminacy, but with claws of, of bears and teeth of, of, uh, of lions, what's that all mean? It's the modern liberalism and, and modernism. They're all smiles, they're all nice, they're all sweet and cuddly, but they rip the souls. They rip the state of grace out of souls and plunge them to hell. That's the modern deception. And this is what we need to be aware of. And this is why, this is why Bishop Follet so successfully fools so many people. He is very kind. He is very gentle. And as a man, I admire him. I mean, I have... Nothing against him as an as a affable man and bishop. But as a bishop, a lieutenant of Jesus Christ, he's effeminate. He's betraying Christ by signing on to Vatican II in the light of tradition, the new mass as legitimate, the new code of canon law. And he, if, had, if he had any, any conviction of the truth, he would publicly reject this publicly burn it and say, I made a huge mistake. I profess the Catholic faith. I profess Christ as God and King. It's not enough for him to say, I, I withdraw the document or uh, it doesn't apply now. No, because as leader of the SSPX, he wasn't given his personal opinion to Rome. He was given and speaking on behalf of all the SSPX priests and all you faithful and all the brothers and nuns of the SSPX and all the affiliate traditional families of the Dominicans, Benedictines, and so forth. He was, he was speaking on the whole family of tradition's behalf. And what did he say? We accept Vatican II in the light of tradition. We accept the new mass as legitimate. We accept all this junk. And that's why we priests said to him, Your Excellency, this is wrong. You have to publicly reject this. And what did he do? The, the effeminate hair of a woman, all smiles and gentle, comes out the claws and the teeth. Expulsions of priests, expulsions of a bishop, silencing of his priests who were loyal sons of Archbishop Lefebvre. This is the behavior of the beasts of this time. And Pope Francis is one of those beasts and so was Pope Paul VI. He was a really effeminate and really had claws. Look what he did to Archbishop Lefebvre. Look what he, with his claws, he suspended him out of Inis, which of course meant nothing. And Pope John Paul II, again, all smiles and kind and cuddly, but he had claws and declared the so-called excommunication of Archbishop Lefebvre, the only loyal son of all the bishops he had in the world. He smashed them. So you see, the apocalypse of St. John applies now. That beast with the women's hair and the teeth of lions and the claws of a bear. There you go. This is our time. So have the sweetness of the sacred heart, but the sacred heart, not of, of a modernist, not the, not the kind heart of a liberal, not the heart of Muhammad or Luther or Buddha, 
But the heart of Jesus Christ the King, he is the only one that is manfully gentle, who loves each soul that he dies for each soul, washes you with his blood, feeds you in this mass with his own divine heart, his own divine fire, his own divine flesh. Because he knows you're weary. We are tired in this battle. He knows we're living in crazy times. And he gives you an outpouring of the treasures of his grace. Let those who thirst come and drink. But don't drink other muddy waters. Drink the true heart of Jesus. The true king. The true God. The true priest. Our Lord Jesus Christ. And his truth. And that we can't water down and compromise, nor effeminize or, co- or, water or compromise with the modern world or the conciliar church. And that's why Archbishop Lefebvre, he was the true, he was a true voice of the Sacred Heart. And notice how he says his words. Notice how he says, for example, the greatest danger threatening are faithful. And he's talking about all these poor Catholics throughout the world struggling to save their soul. The greatest danger threatening our faithful and our people is to put ourselves under the modernists and modernist bishops. And now recently Bishop Follet has asked all the priors, you can see photographs in France, of the priors, some of the priors sitting there with the local diocesan bishop discussing who knows what golf games and sipping over French cognac talking hot air because there's a war between us and Bishop Follet is asking all the priors start inviting the local diocesan bishops to visit the priories of the Society of St. Pius X so that it shows the, the novice order bishops they have nothing to fear when uh, the full reconciliation comes about, which is very soon. When that comes about, they have nothing to fear from these SSPX priests. And they certainly don't, not anymore, because the SSPX priests are caving in with Bishop Fillet. They are following him. The superiors form the inferiors. And that's why to be loyal to our Lord Jesus Christ, to the popes of tradition, to Archbishop Lefebvre, we have to oppose it. We have to be expelled and kicked out. We have to step out of that whole system going with modernism. And that's why the red light applies. The red light to the society masses applies because It's dangerous now. Just last week in St. Mary's, Kansas, a young priest just formed under Father LaRue, just ordained one or two years, two years I think, or three, gave a a sermon, a typical modernist sermon, a Paul VI sermon, the same kind of sermons that, that, in the way the speaking of Bishop Fillet now, where they say a lot of traditional teaching, a lot of good doctrine, but they slip in modernism. And this one was telling these big families of St. Mary's, of course he was right to quote Archbishop Lefebvre, encourage the large families. We have to have a crusade of large families, and that's, that's right. But the poison was when he put in there, oh, all, the, all those mothers who are overwhelmed and parents who are overwhelmed can consider NFP. NFP is basically contraception by the calendar. And uh, parents, the Catholic teaching is the words of God himself. Increase and multiply. God wants children. And you're not allowed to limit and space children. You're not allowed to do this. And Pope Pius XII, when he dealt with NFP, it's under very, very, very serious reasons. And it's an evil that's tolerated only for a a certain time. But to say from the pulpit, if you're overwhelmed, that justifies NFP. That is false. And that is pure liberalism. 
That was the, the birth control being preached by the priests of the 1940s and 50s, right before the council, to limit children. And just think of this, how many children, because of that one sermon last week, how many children are not going to be born now? Once liberalism and the new doctrine is hitting the SSPX at the ground level now, it's a new doctrine. That is not the Catholic doctrine. Our Lord's doctrine is pick up the cross and follow me. And you parents know, having all the children God sends you, it's hard. It's hard work. It's not always roses. And St. John Bosco knew that too. In the vision of the, the walk of roses, on the outside working with the youth looks fun and easy, but it's like walking on thorns. And so when, they, when his brothers in the, in the dream he had, they were walking on the roses expecting a fun time, and the brothers and the priests were walking on thorns, saying, Ouch, this hurts. And you, you parents know this, especially now. If anything, you need to hear from the pulpit. Take all the children God sends. Take 50 children, 30 children, 20, how many He sends. And God will bless you, because out of them He wants heaven full. And carry your cross. That's what the parents need to hear. Carry your cross. Our Lord will bless you. Take the children that He gives you. But this liberal mentality of spacing, if I'm overwhelmed or I can't educate them perfectly, that's false. And that's, what one, of the, that's one of the reasons that priest gave last week, is if you can't give them a, a promising education, a good education, a pristine education, well, you, you should consider spacing or limiting. That's false. Can you imagine St. John Vianney's parents? Because they couldn't afford him to put them all in school? We would never have had St. John Vianney. We would never have had St. Bernadette. Because the parents could not afford a pristine education for their kids. That's complete liberalism. And God will punish this kind of speak. And that sermon was given at every Mass. And all the priests should have rebuked that young priest. And that young priest needs to go to the seminary again, not Winona, Kentucky, and get his head straightened out. Or to John Thomas Aquinas, or to the Dominicans in France. But this is what's happening, and it's approved by the priests. And it was even a sly mockery remark in the sermon saying, having all these children is not a race. It's not a race. To, to speak that way is wrong. So I want to speak as a Catholic priest. And I want to give you the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ and of His Catholic Church, not the phony conciliar church. And the Catholic Church of Tradition says, take all the children God sends you. That each one is a blessing. And love each child and raise them as best you can to get to heaven. And God will give you the grace. Come after me, all you. All you who want to come after me, pick up your cross. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross. Carry it daily. And follow me. And that's the happy way. It's the happy way. There's no other happy way than to carry and embrace the cross that all of us are given. If you try to run from the cross and put it down, it's going to just cut you up with the splinters. It's going to get heavier and awkward. But if we learn from our Lord, carry the cross. Trust in the grace of God. Serve God joyfully, peacefully, happily, and patiently in suffering. And you'll discover through the cross comes the greatest joy. It even becomes lighter. It even becomes sweet. And it even becomes... In the mouth of St. Teresa, uh, I'd rather suffer than to die. Or in the words of St. Peter Alcantara, who died today in the time of St. Teresa of Avila, he did many penances. He was a man of many penances. And uh, when he died, St. Teresa of Avila saw his soul go straight to heaven. And he appeared to her later and said, Oh, what happy penances! I did on earth that merited me such great glory in heaven. 
So, today you don't really have to go far to find your penance. Make the sign of the cross in the public place, at grace. Don't join in the filthy talk of the co-workers. Be honest in your business. Love and cherish your wives. That's hard to do in an age that you can just dial a number and get a divorce. Love and cherish your wives. And wives, respect and honor your husband. And love your femininity, which the modern world is smashing. Love to be what God made you, a woman. A reflection of the Virgin Mary. Dress like a woman also. Don't wear pants. That's a shame on a woman. Love to dress as a woman. Love what, what God gave you. And believe me, believe me, it's true. Men respect and admire a woman who is a woman. It's just something so unique. And these are your penances. And what a penance, you know. A mother with 15, 10 children, 8 children today going into shopping. And all the looks, all the horrible remarks, all the smart smirks. Even the doctors now. Oh, well, well we can solve this problem. We can terminate this pregnancy. Horrible thing. And so, you don't have to go far to find your penance, that's for sure. But let you, well, that all you do be out of love for God. And let's learn that from St. Teresa, the child Jesus, from all the saints, all the apostles, and the sacred heart of Jesus and Mary. O Mary, conceive without sin. O Mary, conceive without sin. O Mary, conceive without sin. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.